Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's, it's great to be back in Santa Barbara to attend this wonderful workshop. And to see such a, such a large attendance, I, I understand that next time I have to imagine a talk on black holes and artificial intelligence. <laughs> Still not know how to do that, but I will, I will, I will think about it. <laughs> clearly, clearly, there is something about artificial intelligence that arouses enormous curiosity, uh, perhaps a little bit of fear or excitement. Certainly, there is no lack of uh, very passionate statements, and I will start with a few of them. Um, what's actually happening is machines are powering all of us. They may not yet be inside our bodies, but by the 2030s, we'll connect our neocortex, the part of our brain where we do our thinking, to the cloud. We are going to get more neocortex, we are going to be funnier, we are going to be better at music, we are going to be sexier. <laughs> you may believe it or not, I don't, but this is some uh, educated guess in some sense by Ray Kurzweil who got uh, the MIT Levinson Prize and the National Medal of Technology, so he has all the credentials, and he's one of these hyper enthusiasts about uh, AI. Uh, our colleague in, uh, in uh, University of California, San Diego, Teresa Sejnowski, uh, has a simpler sentence, but also a very strong one. Artificial intelligence will make you smarter. This was a positive side. Now we can look at uh, the negative side. You have certainly have heard or have read about Elon Musk saying that AI is a fundamental existential risk for human civilization. In a way that car accidents, airplane crashes, faulty drugs, or bad food were not. They were harmful to a set of individuals in society, but they were not harmful to society as a whole. And uh, again, a, a colleague, uh, very well known and uh, much uh, respected, Stephen Hawking, I fear that AI may replace humans altogether. If people design computer viruses, someone will design AI that improves and replicates itself. This will be a new form of life that outperforms humans. One should say that Stephen Hawking, since, as you know, since uh, the 80s, had been using a series of computer-assisted communication system in order to communicate. And so he had also witnessed himself in his everyday life the progress of the software and uh, uh, even of some relatively primitive uh, version of AI, but which helped to, to help him a lot to, to communicate. So these are two sides, let's say, of the very pessimistic and the very enthusiastic. Let us try to see um, um, the new era of, of AI. Why do we talk about AI so much? It has existed after, after all for maybe 70 years. People have been talking about artificial intelligence. What, why, why are we talking about it now? Well, because in the last decade, there has been an enormous progress which has been made on some specific topic. And among these, probably the most uh, spectacular one is about image understanding, classification of images, detection of faces, segmentation. I will try to show you a, little, a few examples of that. A big event was um, the challenge around the ImageNet database. ImageNet database is a large database of images, millions of images, which have been, which one has to classify into a thousand categories. And these categories, they have been found by, by people who were working heavily on these millions of images, images saying, uh, I don't know, this is a dog, etc. this is a car in front of a house, and so on. And so they, have, they are labeled. And, uh, and the challenge was given to the computer scientists to try to have a computer program, a machine, that will look at each of these images and give the correct classification. And uh, if you go back to 2010, well, most of the computer programs that were competing for on this, on this uh, challenge, they did not de do very well. They were doing more than 50% errors. That was very bad. This is the number of errors. You see that gradually it progresses. There is a big breakthrough in 2012. 2012 is the moment in which entered in the competition the first deep network. 
deep neural network. I will tell you what it is uh, later on. And that all of a sudden made a big break with, uh, breakthrough with respect to all the other programs. It was, it was really there that people realized that, yes, it was maybe possible to do something. And immediately, because science is going very fast, there were tens of groups using these same kind of methods, and the progress has been steady. And now, 2017, um, nearly all the competitors had less than 5% images wrong. So this, OK, this is a, a joke. This is a game for, for scientists. But uh, what is it about? Well. It means that using this kind of, pro of software now, we can segment an image. We can look at an image like that and have the computer tell you, well, on this image, there is a sky, there are buildings, there are cars, there are pedestrians, etc., etc. And it can give you, it can write for you what is the content of this image. But if you have done this analysis, it means that you know what is the, the environment. And this, obviously, it opens the way to autonomous self-driving cars. And we shall talk about them a bit later on. It also opened the way to trucks, convoys of self-driving trucks, which also have their first competition. It's a big issue. Uh, in Europe, there are 13 million of heavy trucks on the road. Uh, certainly in the US, it must be even more than that. Number of truck drivers is very important. So if there is a, a real breakthrough on, on this topic, it will change a large part of the organization of the society. On another, another subject, image recognition, this progress in image recognition, it has been applied recently in a paper in Nature last year to uh, trying to identify epidermal lesions, classify them between benign or malignant. And um, in this work, after training on the database of 130,000 clinical images, it turned out that the artificial neural network, this, one of these deep network, achieved performances on par with all tested experts, the best dermatologists, demonstrating an artificial intelligence capable of classifying skin cancer with a level of competence comparable to dermatologists. And this can be done with images which have the resolution of what you take with your smartphone. So obviously, this opened the way to using mobile devices and uh, extend the reach of dermatologists outside of the clinic, which is something uh, quite, quite important. Always in health, there has been also very recently uh, uh, a w series of papers working on trying to improve the prognostic prediction of lung carcinoma. And uh, what they did is that uh, they looked at um, thousands of stain histopathology images and trying to determine what kind of lung carcinoma it was and if there was a, what was the probability of short-term versus long-term survivors. So it means that you have to analyze these kind of images and uh, the results suggests that automatically derived image feature can predict the prognosis of lung cancer patients and thereby contribute to precision oncology. The methods are extensible to histopathology images of other organs. So you see that we are, we are really seeing a, a, a very uh, big progress in image analysis to the point that they can really, these machines can compete with the bet, best experts in each of these very well identified tasks. It's not the only, image recognition is not the only field in which uh, there has been progress. There has been also several other fields. I, I have listed a few of them here. Language understanding, lip reading, predicting the activity of potential drug molecules, analyzing particle accelerator data. That's a bit technical, but that's just for my friends, the physicist, it's, uh, it's useful. <laughs> Designing new molecules for biochemistry, playing games. Let us see. Uh, a few of them. Uh, the progress in uh, language understanding is, is certainly uh, quite substantial. Uh, I don't know if you use language translator yourself, but if you do, you will see that you will have, we will have seen that in the recent two, three, four years, the software has improved a lot. So now you have good translator online. You also have good translator for the voice. 
it does a reasonable job. So here is one example if it works. Bonjour, comment allez-vous? Quel temps magnifique aujourd'hui à Santa Barbara. Hello, how are you so beautiful today in Santa Barbara? I hate this voice. <laughs> so the, the system is far from perfect, but it is clear that very soon we all have devices like that that will help us in our everyday life language translation, which is a relatively easy task, but it, it used that it used to be that we could not do that. We do, did not have the devices. Now we have them. Of course, you will tell me, but what about literary translation? So I went to one of these uh, uh, smart uh, uh, translator that you find online, and uh, I typed the beginning of uh, uh, La Recherche du Temps Perdu, and uh, uh, for those who read French, and that, that is a translation that came out in English. For a long time, I went to bed early, Sometimes, as soon as my candle went out, my eyes would close so quickly that I didn't have time to say to myself, I'm falling asleep. Good job. Really good job. I'm, I, I even wonder whether they have uh, hardwired it in some sense and <laughs> taken it from a translator. I don't know. But, but it is clear that literary translation is a different topic. That is, no machine will decide whether the title, de À la recherche du temps perdu, you should translate it as in search of lost time, or you should translate it as remembrance of things past. Both have been used by different persons translating it. Just because literary translation, it's a, it's a human activity, it's a creative activity, it's creative writing. So I think that from this point of view, literary translation can be assisted by this kind of device, but it will remain a, a human based activity. The last example I wanted to give is uh, games. Um, the first shot was chess. Some of you will remember that in 1997, I think, uh, Deep, Deep Blue, the computer Deep Blue, was winning the first game against uh, uh, Kasparov, the world champion. But Deep Blue was a program machine. It was a machine that had had programmed it with all the rules and so on, it was mainly using its power to, to see how all the possibilities further away than the uh, human player. And this strategy we knew, everybody knew, that it could not be applied to Go because in the Go game, the moves, there are many, many more possible moves at each time, at, at each move, many, many possibilities. And so Go seemed to be something that was uh, really only a human game. And, and, and so it, it is this result in 2016 when the, the machine AlphaGo won against Lee Sidor, it was really a big, uh, a big shock. AlphaGo had been, learn, had been learning by machine learning that I will describe to you from analyzing 160,000 games, human games. So people started to say, well, it's a bit cheating. He has, this machine has analyzed all the games, but the games have been invented by the human. And the next year, there was a second machine which learned just by itself, by generating game and playing against itself and finding which strategy is the best. Generated millions of games. They don't get tired. And, and now they are the smartest machine. So let us open the black box and have a look at what these machines are. Um, the first thing is machine learning. The idea, and that's a really very important paradigm, which is the idea that the machine will not really program it in all detail, but it will learn by itself. So what is a machine? A machine is a computer program. It, you will feed it with some input. It has a number of parameters of um, uh, things to be decided inside the machine and it produces an output. And what you would like, people have been spending an enormous time about yeah, identifying cats and dogs. So you would like a machine, when you present to it a, a, a picture of a cat, it outputs cat. Picture of a dog, it outputs dog. Our colleagues in computer science have spent quite a lot of time trying to find these machines and to design the machine completely. You know, putting some masks that will uh, 
that will go on the picture and try to see a triangular shape so that maybe it is the ear of a cat and then you find a second one and then you find maybe a whisker and then you find a cat. It never worked. Because the cat can be in all kinds of positions, all kinds of... So it does not work. And the thing which works is a completely different uh, attitude, which is to say, we have a machine, it has a, num a large number of parameters inside that you have to find. You have to find the best values of this parameter. And you will let the machine learn by itself. And what you will do is that you will present a large database, many images of cats, many, many images of cats, many, many ma images of dogs. And you will let the machine adapt and try to find the best parameters so that in the end, for each cat, it outputs cat, and for each dog, it outputs dog. Of course, if you do that for a huge machine, and uh, you will need a huge database, that will be a part, a part of the game. And then in the next stage, what you will have to do is, is test the machine, because maybe the machine has just learned all the pictures that you have shown it. Instead, what you would like is that it has, in some sense, it is able to identify a new cat, one which was not in the database of the cat. And that's the test, the test phase, and that's really the challenge. The real challenge is this one. So in order to do that, you will, you will test with a new picture of a cat, new picture of a dog, and here you will say, okay, that's a mistake. And basically, you will, you will evaluate the performance of the machine on a new test set, and you will see how many errors it makes. So these competitions, they are very well defined. You, you understand how it goes. So this is a concept of machine learning. It's important means that we give up. We, we give up the idea that we are so smart that we can ourselves prepare all the, all the parameters and design the, all the details of the machine. We let the machine by itself, by some kind of self-organized process that I will describe to you, find the right parameters. Now, what machines are used? These famous deep networks that are the ones that are achieving this nice performance I was showing to you. Um, well, basically, the idea came long ago, and it was an idea of pattern recognition. Imagine that, imagine that you have the, another challenge, uh, just to vary a bit, not to talk only about cats and dogs, but you want to identify these, these digits. A child recognizes that easily. And how does, it, does a child do? Well, he has a wonderful machine, which is the brain and the visual area, which, uh, which is able to process all that. This visual area, it has uh, information is in, is in the neurons. The neuron has a, is a cell. It has a, a nucleus, and it has a body and an axon. And basically, what happens in a, in a neuron is that you will have a signal which is sent from the body of the, of the neuron along the axon, and then it, it, it is transmitted to other neurons along these, what is called synapses, the, which is a contact between one neuron and the other ones. So it is a complicated uh, object, but basically one understands the rules of how the neurons work. And uh, already long ago, uh, scientists started to abstract them and to say, okay, let us design artificial neuron. What would an artificial neuron do? So an artificial neuron would be this, this object here. It will receive inputs from other neurons through the synapses. Now the synapse, it may, it may have a certain efficiency, so maybe this guy has sent a signal, maybe the signal is amplified at the synapse, maybe it is not. Maybe if there is a strong incoming signal, this one is depleted, its activity is lowered. So there will be a number which gives the efficacy of the synapse. Efficacy of the transmission, it's what I call, what we call the weight, the weight of the transmission. And then the neuron basically, these are, in the end, these are electric potential. And uh, the neuron, what it does is that it adds up all these signals and it outputs the sum. At least if the sum is beyond a certain threshold, it will fire and it will output the sum. So this is what is taking place uh, in the brain. Can you recognize digits, cats, dogs, and so on using these kind of devices? Well, this idea uh, was there already in the 50s. Um, a colleague, uh, Frank Rosenblatt in Cornell, came up with this idea. He said, okay, let us have, uh, maybe I have 10, 10 output neurons here. 
I wire them, I, I have this input, which is an image. The image has a certain activity. And this neuron here, it will, it will do the, the sum of all the signals coming from all over the picture, put some weights, well adapted weights, and maybe it will be identified, it will be able to identify the five. In, in the 50s, it was very fashionable. Actually, uh, the work of Rosenblatt made it to the New York Times, which is a signal of something, and with big hopes that it was a revolutionary and there was a lot of funding. Uh, uh, if you convert it into dollars of today, it, it was really big, uh, big science going on there. Until, uh, unfortunately, a few years later, the mathematicians realized that the perceptron is intrinsically limited. There are tasks that it is not able to do. And uh, so the we had to give up uh, uh, the perceptron, but still this idea of computing on the basis of this small object, these small artificial neurons, which are in some sense very elementary processors, which just sum the signal that they receive and send it and forward it, very easy. This idea was, was pushed and uh, there was a big, uh, a big moment of study of neural network in the 80s, but um, until the recent time, um, it was not so successful. And what has changed? What has made it successful recently? Well, first of all, we had, but this already, we had it already in the 80s. We have gone from the simple perceptron to multi-layer deep networks that I will describe. Secondly, very important, we have very large databases. When you want to do machine learning, you need a lot of data. Thirdly, even more important, we have much, much more computing power. I mean, what, uh, what Rosenblatt could use is nothing, nothing compared to what you have in your phone or anything like that. And a few minor improvements also uh, turned out uh, to be, uh, to be uh, crucial. So the database, one historical database, was a database of, uh, called MNIST database, which was uh, 70,000 images of handwritten digits. Okay. You ask, it was asked uh, some uh, students, high school students and so on, to write a lot of handwritten digits. And that's the database that has been used to train a uh, neural network. So uh, people started to go from uh, the simple perceptron to slice to a slightly more sophisticated uh, uh, network in which you have here the image. So that in these images, they are 28 by 28. It means 70, 784 neurons. I have not drawn all of them, but uh, just a small sample. They send messages here. They send signals to this hidden layer of 15 neurons. And then there is the output. This, uh, this turns out to be a universal computer. You don't have this limitation of the perceptron, so you can hope that it will do well. And uh, the challenge is to find the 12,000 parameters that will achieve the task of reading the 100 digits. And basically, you do that nearly, nearly by trial and error. As you will see, look, this neuron here, it receives a lot of, a lot of input. For instance, it receives the input from this guy. It has a certain efficacy. It was just transmitting with a factor one half. Instead of one half, I, I say 0.6. Does it improve the output or not? If it improves the output, I adopt the 0.6. If it's, if it's worse, maybe I try 0.4. You have to do that for 12,000 parameters on the 60,000 digits. Huge task, but our computers know how to crunch these numbers efficiently. And so you do that, and you find after a long training phase, you can test on the remaining 10,000 examples. This very simple guy that I showed here is already able to have the correct answer at 96%. And slightly more sophisticated version succeed in nearly all the 10,000 examples. The ones that it cannot identify are these ones. And honestly, I would not know what the student was wanted to write. <laughs> so we can say that Handwritten digit recognition, it has been solved. That is, we know how to do it as well as possible. Now, the images, it was another challenge. And, uh, and for the images, one had to go into deep architecture. Deep architecture, actually, there is nothing deep in that. Uh, but the name was very well chosen in terms of marketing, that's clear. 
what uh, the deep here just means that you add up some layers. You had the input layer, a first hidden layer, you had the second one, third one, and now I cannot draw it, but you have architectures with hundreds of thousands of artificial neurons organized on hundreds of layers. If I would like, if I would put that on the screen, you could not see anything. It's much too, much too large. But then you have to train it with Zoom. You have to find one million parameters. And so you need very big database. And so the next ingredients was the, the having at your disposal very big uh, network, very big uh, database. And um, in some sense, all these machines are using the same ideas as were used in the 80s, but uh, the computing power, the database, and the, and the use of deep networks, these are the three ingredients which made the progress possible. So if ever, like me, you were wondering why people are putting so many images of cats on the web, I still don't know, but I know what it is good for. It is good for training the, the neural network, that's clear. What, we, what one see, for instance, if one looks at one of these networks which identifies faces, which is one of the big successes also that I, have, I should mention because that's a very important one, what one sees is that really there is a new computing paradigm. That is, um, there will be a collective representation of the image in each layer. And in the first layers, you will see, you will identify very tiny things, like, you know, identify some small edge, some small regions. If you go deeper into the network, you will start to identify lines. A bit more deeper, you will start to identify maybe an eye, a nose, and so on. And only at the end, you will, you will have the full vision. So in some sense, when you progress along the network, you have a more and, and more high-level representation of the image. And that's really the, the miracle that is taking place in this, uh, in this learning. So, very good, here we are. Everything is perfect. Nice machines, we're able to train them, they are smart. Have they solved all the problems? Well, there are a few, uh, couple of clouds in this very sunny landscape, and I will try to, to underline uh, probably three of them, just in my opinion, the three main problems. The first problem is the, is the question of the large amount of data. The second problem is not a small problem, is the fact that we have absolutely no understanding of what is taking place. And the third one is the fact that uh, these machines have no general intelligence. And I will address each of these problems uh, in sequence. Huge amount of labeled data is necessary for learning in deep network. This is very impractical from a technological point of view. It also means that you have to, you need to have um, people working on putting the label and saying if you want to identify something, you need to have crowds of people somewhere in the world who will take the image and tell you in this image there is a cat, in that image there is a dog, and so on and so forth. Very impractical. This also demonstrates that these deep networks are still very far from mimicking the activity of our brain. How many examples of a cat does a baby see before he builds a mental representation of the concept cat? Actually, very few. Um, here is, uh, sorry for the quality of the image, here is a, a picture of, a, of a, an experiment taking place in the, in the Department of Cognitive Science at Ecole Normale in my home place, where uh, uh, my colleague Anne Christophe is working on language acquisition by, by uh, babies, 20 months old. And here, um, she has been playing with a, with a baby for uh, some time uh, with these four toys. And these four toys, they were designed as, uh, designated as, this is a co-rabbit, this is a co-hen, this is a K-tractor, and this is a K-book. And they played with the children, just, oh, give me the, co the, the K-tractor. Give me the co-hand, and so on and so forth. And after that, at some point, there is projected on the screen, there are these two images. And you have an eye tracker, and, uh, and you follow the eyes of the, of the baby. And you ask the baby, oh, look at the co-bamoul. Do you see the co-bamoul? Bamoul is a word that the baby has never heard. So what is your opinion? Which one is the co-bamoul? Who thinks that this is a co-bamoul? Who thinks, one person? 
Who thinks that that is a Koba move? Quite a few, but there are many people who are hesitating. You are not, uh, <laughs> you are not taking risks. Huh? Well, this is obviously a Koba mool, because ko was a prefix that was uh, that was used for the two toys which were animals. And this, if it is something, it looks more like an animal than 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 this other toy. And actually, the children, the babies, they generalize. So they generalize, and they will point to this one much more frequently than to that one. So with two examples, they generalize, not 200,000. So this demonstrates that we are still far away from understanding the real mechanism of, 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 of what uh, takes place in the brain. And so we have a nice challenge that we have set up uh, uh, there in this department of cognitive science, which is uh, asking, the, asking the computer scientists to build a, an algorithm, a machine, that will uh, maybe a deep neural network or another one that learns a language on the basis of what has been heard by a baby in his first year of life. It's an experimental fact that nearly all babies after one year of life, they, have, they understand. Maybe they don't speak, but they understand the language. And actually, this understanding, it does not really, it's not directly correlated to the amount of data that they have had, because depending on the society in which they, they live, on the cultural background and so on, maybe some of them will hear five times or ten times more words than other ones. And more or less, between 10 and 12 months, they all make it. This is not at all the way that our neural networks are, are learned. So this was point one. Point two, uh, what do we know about uh, the deep network? What do we understand? This is beautiful. We know everything. We have all the parameters. We have the list, I can tell you, the signal which is sent from this guy to this guy, it is multiplied by 0.33. Great. I know everything. It's, in some sense, it's the dream of the neuroscientist. It's as if you had a neuroscientist which knows all the activity of all the neurons in the brain and the efficacy of all the synapses. You see, these, these colleagues uh, last year uh, wrote uh, an interesting uh, paper which the title was, Could a Neuroscientist Understand a Microprocessor? And uh, they looked at the microprocessor, an old one actually, and uh, they used all the possible tools in order to see what there is in this microprocessor. How it, and they found, they found a lot of things. They found how it is wired, how the signal is transmitted, which part is crucial. The microprocessor was using, it was actually, a, it was used, uh, it was an old one used to play Space Invaders, that's really for the oldest in the audience, but that's a game of 1978. And, it's, and this microprocessor, so they could, they could use it, and they did some um, shutdown experiment in which they will destroy this small piece and see if the processor is still working, if you can still play the game or not. So they found that some are crucial, others are not, and so on. They have a lot of information. They never were able to understand what it is doing. And so uh, this, is, this is something very interesting, actually, um, because you know everything, but you understand nothing. <laughs> but that is, that is very interesting for the physicist. And in some sense, this is where the activity of the physicist and, and someone like me, I am a statistical physicist. And the idea of statistical physics is to understand emergence, emerging properties. What are emerging properties? Emerging properties are properties that, that appear only when you have a collective action of a lot of different molecules. Take water molecules. They are all the same, exactly all the same. Depending on the circumstances, these water molecules, they can be a crystal, they can be a liquid, they can be a, a vapor, they will deposit on glass, and so on. These are very different objects. I mean, the Titanic, it, it had the bad luck of going into water molecules that was organized in a solid, and a very strong solid. And it sunk. So it means that there is an emergent property. The collective behavior of all these molecules is not the same, depending on the circumstances. That is emergence. And emergence, in some sense, I, I, I had taken this small drawing. It's interesting. You have this piece of a, of a picture. And locally, you see nothing. But the emergence is what comes globally. When you see the global behavior, you see emerging a pattern. 
And that's what we are really not able to understand uh, fully at the moment in the artificial neural network. This is bad because it means that we have no guarantee of that it works in all circumstances. And uh, this lack of guarantee is really annoying. Let me give you another example. The, the, I always take images because the images, they are more fun. So among the nice images, some colleagues decided to work not on cats and dogs, but on pandas and gibbons. And uh, you ask the neural network to be able to distinguish between a, a panda and a gibbon. You train it. And guess what? After a long training, you have a very smart neural network. It identifies everybody. Good. You take this neural network and you present this picture. What does it answer? It's a panda. And it answers panda. Not with very good confidence, but still it answers panda. And now I present to the neural network this, that picture. What does it answer? It answers gibbon. Why? Why? Well, the two look very much the same to us. What the colleagues who has done that had done is very perverse. He did what is called an adversarial attack. It is it, he decided to attack the neural network by presenting a pattern. So it superimposed on the original image. The original image will, was well identified. It superimposed this pattern. This pattern has been carefully computed by another neural network, actually, in order to fool the machine. And so this, you know, it has a sm very small coefficient in front. So it means that when you add that to that with this small coefficient, you don't see any difference. I don't see any difference. But the machine is fooled by this very small here. There might be probably one pixel, which has changed a little bit, and so on. And with that, the machine is completely fooled. That's bad. <laughs> another, another example, another machine had been trained to identify bananas. You present this object, it says banana, 99% probability. Good, that's a good training. Now you present this thing, and it answers toaster. <laughs> Why? Because another perverse team of scientists, there are many of them, Another perverse team of scientists has added a patch, a, a sticker. It put this sticker on the table, and this sticker has been designed very carefully by training another, from another machine for hours and hours in such a way that it will fool the original neural network. And so because of the presence of the patch, you can no longer identify the banana. It is even very bad, because imagine now that you are in a self-driving car. It has been very well, <laughs> very well trained. It identifies the stop signs and so on. But a, some guy, at some point, put a sticker on the stop sign. And maybe your car sees this thing and says, oh, there is a toaster there. <laughs> maybe it speeds up. Well, this is a bit dangerous. And I think that it is one, at the moment, in terms of practical application, it's certainly one of the limitations. And, uh, and this, this question of the fact that we don't really know what is happening, I mean, the, the, the previous examples of the, of the panda clearly shows that these machines are not doing the same thing as our visual cortex, certainly not. In principle, this is not bad, but the fact that it can be fooled this way, this is a serious issue. And in terms of using it for practical application, I think it's, a, it's a, probably a major problem. Um, let me go to the third uh, limitation, the fact that there is no general intelligence. Um, if I go back to the sticker on the stop sign, which is now seen as a toaster, an intelligent analysis of the, of the scene of an intelligent machine would be surprised and start to ask questions and say, OK, why is there a toaster? That is not possible. Uh, that's nonsense. OK, first of all, I, I slow down, I stop, and I will analyze the situation. Um, that's not what, he, what is happening. I mean, at the moment, what we have in our neural network, they are very smart. I show you all the smart things that they can do. But they are machines that solve very specific problems, very well posed, very well defined and with a very simple measure of performance. 
So that's, a, that's another limitation. It brings me to my fifth and last uh, chapter, which is uh, discussing a little bit, a bit superficially, but that's what I can do in, the, in this time that we have, a little bit what is uh, intelligence. And I will, that's a very complicated topic. Philosophers have been discussing that for many years. I will discuss a little, just one aspect of it, which is scientific intelligence. Intelligence as we apply it in science. I decided to take this angle because I, I think that I know a little bit more about that intelligence than, than other, other type of intelligence. Actually, I was, I was challenged to think about that by uh, an article in 2008, by, uh, which appeared in, in Wired by Chris Anderson. The title was The End of Theory, The Data Deluge Makes the Scientific Method Obsolete. Faced with massive, da massive data, the traditional approach to science, hypothesize, model, test, is becoming obsolete. Sorry. The new availability of huge amounts of data, along with the statistical tools to crunch these numbers, offers a whole new way of understanding the world. Correlation supersedes causation, and science can advance even without coherent models, unified theories, or really any mechanistic explanation at all. Wow. For us so physicists, for us scientists in the audience, it's bad news. I mean, it's no, <laughs> it's no longer just, you know, playing with, uh, with pandas, uh, gibbons, uh, bananas, and so on, but it's Galileo himself which is, who is being attacked now. I mean, it's just the whole scientific method. And so, and so uh, let me try to show you uh, uh, reasoning, uh, try to explain you what is the difference. You can imagine the following thought experiment. Imagine that you have uh, an experimentalist which does a lot of experiments of throwing objects into the air and uh, looking at the trajectory and uh, with a video camera you can feed that on uh, the input of a neural network and you have a lot of data. In all the data you measure the size of the object, the initial velocity, the angle, the speed, etc. And, uh, and you ask the neural network to predict where it will fall. Simple enough prediction. So it falls very well into the range of what, in principle, it's a well-defined task, well-defined objective. So um, probably it's a thought experiment, but I guess that if one would uh, spend enough time on it, one would uh, find a, a deep network which, uh, after being well trained, it would be able to give good predictions. You give it the mass, you give it the initial velocity, the initial rotation, the shape, etc., velocity of the wind, all, all kinds of parameters. It will predict where the object falls back on the floor. Maybe it could do that as good as, the sci as what the scientist would do, which is solving Newton's equation. So that's really the challenge. Which one is best, the deep network or the physicist? Well, you know what I will answer, of course. Um, the physicist, basically, the physicist uses a scientific model, which has been elaborated over centuries now. This scientific model has a compact representation. And this compact representation, it can be decomposed into modules. The, the core module would be gravity and Newton's law. From that, you would predict that the object has a parabolic trajectory. That's what you learn the first year, or you learn it whenever you like in high school. And um, then you will add the, uh, the, the effect of friction of the air. Maybe if you are smart and you have a moving and rotating object, you will add the Magnus force, which is the one that the tennis players are using to, to modify the trajectory of the ball. And basically, here you see the scientific intelligence at work. It uses these modules, these, these, uh, these models and these modules, and it combines them. And it adds them more and more in a more and more sophisticated way. And this composition of elementary laws can be then applicable in a different context. Because once I have that, I can use the same law to determine how an object moves if I am in another fluid with a different law of friction, with a different constant of friction. I can use it in very different circumstances. If I am smart enough, I will, I will understand that there is the law of gravity is also the one that, that applies to the movement of planets. 
So it's a completely uh, much more general uh, setup of being able to combine the models and to apply them in different contexts. And that is how in, uh, scientific intelligence is working. It's much more than just predicting the trajectory and the impact point. So the lesson is that deep networks, they are very smart, but they have no reasoning, no representation of the world, no consciousness, no attention, no possibility to apply knowledge in different contexts or to combine it with other information. So we are very, very far from the goal of some people, which is to have general artificial intelligence, the one that would be the, that may be uh, the mythic one in which you have an artificial intelligence which, is, uh, which takes the full power on us. We are very far from that. So, um, but we also see, and, uh, and to be fair, I should, I should mention that, that what we have witnessed is a kind of drift of what we call intelligence in some sense. That is, I am more and more putting more and more pressure on what is intelligence. Maybe a few years ago, people would have said, well, you know, playing chess, a good chess player is an intelligent person. He is able to think. Now we say, we say okay, playing chess is a well-defined rule. It's complicated and so on. But it's not so much of an intelligent behavior in the sense that I was mentioning before, that you have this module, you can apply it in other circumstances and so on and so forth. So we have, we have this drift. So as, as a conclusion, I wanted to... I'm sure that you would ask me the question, so now what is going to happen with all of that? And so I prefer to answer it now. Um, um, predicting the future is notably uh, difficult. <laughs> These are just a few statements made by uh, uh, illustrious predecessors. They all failed miserably. And I will certainly do the same uh, now in front of you but I will nevertheless try to point out uh, 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 what is the situation. Um, what will happen? Well, image analysis, language processing, recommendation systems, these are very specific problems, well posed with a simple measure of performance. And this is clear that we have this progress that we have seen, it will go on. And um, it is based on the ability of AI to detect subtle patterns in massive amounts of data with major technological breakthrough. It is also something that is very impressive. It is a global evolution, extremely fast. If you think about it, if you go back to one of the first slides, I told you the big breakthrough was 2012, the, the challenge on identifying the images. And 2012, it's yesterday. I mean, three years after that, the whole world was designing these deep networks and trying to analyze it, to, to analyze uh, skin cancer and all kinds of things. So it, it is also going uh, extremely fast and it will have a significant impact on a large number of human activities and transform many jobs. For the first time, maybe, some people compare it to the Industrial Revolution. One thing that is different is that maybe for the first time it really addresses uh, I mean, the Industrial Revolution was, in some sense, having a machine that substitutes people in terms of physical power, physical strength. Now it is intellectual power, and that's, that's a new aspect of it, which, is, which can be somewhat, uh, somewhat scary. So, if you have a positive view, you will say, and all this is probably true, it will help to have much better diagnosis in medicine. This is around the corner, and that's certainly very good. It will help in having much faster search for case law. It will help for this displacement of people and goods along railways, certainly, freeways, maybe. Uh, although the, pro the serious problem of the banana with the sticker is still around there, and you have to remember that. It will help to have devices that help people to have fast access to relevant information, customer support, robots that can help, for instance, robots for, that help elderly people, they are making quite a lot of, of progress, identification of pathogens, developments of new drugs, smart language assistance. This is only a small, a short list, let's say. If you have a more concerned point of view, you can fear that there will be large destruction of some type of jobs and that this will happen on a time scale which is quite fast, and that the society will have 
hard time to adapt because when there is a fast job, fast job destruction, you, you have to create the new jobs. And that is not so, not so easy. And so you could look at each of these items there and also have maybe um, the negative view. Um, I, was, uh, I was telling you if you have, uh, for instance, the displacement, sorry, if you have the displacement of uh, people, oh, I'm sorry. Here it is. Displacement of people along, uh, along uh, freeways or, or of goods. Well, I, I told you about the problem of the, of the tracks, for instance. That is certainly uh, a loss of, uh, of many jobs. The access to information. It is clear that the access to information has been developed a lot. At the same time, you also see that the information can be manipulated and you have spam and so on. You have customer support, but at the same time, you have profiling of the people. I'm not sure anyone really wants to you know, profile to be hanging there in all these, in all these machines or not. And you have robots that can help you, but you can also have robots that can become autonomous, that are able to make autonomous decisions about shooting, about killing someone. That is, a, that is another, another concern, of course. Rather than the future, I would like to talk about the present and a little, a few words on AI in the political world. And that is something that is, in my opinion, at least for me, a major concern, which is the control of populations and the manipulation of information. Uh, last week, actually, uh, George Soros in Davos made this statement, I want to call attention to the mortal danger facing open societies from the instruments of control that machine learning and artificial intelligence can put in the hands of repressive regimes. And then he talked about China, where the rapidly expanding information available about a person is going to be consolidated in a centralized database to create a social credit system. And we know that this is taking place. There are rankings of people where you gather all kinds of data about, it goes from the financial bank record to how they behave on the street to if they post a political opinion and all kinds of things. And this can certainly be threatful. This is not only there. In 2018, in the last few months, Malaysia has equipped the police forces with face recognition devices. Singapore has an experimental program to equip every lamppost with a camera connected to a facial recognition facility and a crowd analytics software. Zimbabwe signed a deal with China to build a national image data basis. And as we all know, in the last three years, we have seen many examples of smart political, smart political manipulation of information. This, I will not enter that. It's much too touchy a subject. I leave it to, I leave it to the experts. Um, <laughs> To Robert Mueller, maybe, or I don't know. Um, so it is clear that there is an urgent need for control mechanism. One needs to elaborate ethical rules. One needs to also develop a global vision on the possible impacts of AI on our societies. And that is certainly a big challenge in front of us. Um, Henry Kissinger had this statement last year also, philosophically, intellectually, in every way, human society is unprepared for the rise of artificial intelligence. And I kind of share this opinion. Okay, I did not want to end my talk on these pessimistic remarks. And, uh, and while preparing it uh, yesterday, I realized that this was nearly the end of the talk and that I had, I had something wrong. Because in every talk, there should be a joke. <laughs> and it is very difficult. It's very difficult because a joke is something which is essentially cultural. It's a cultural marker. For me, I don't know anything about baseball, for instance. I mean, half of the jokes that I listen to when I am in a conference, they are about baseball. I don't understand anything about that. <laughs> so how can I make a joke? And so I was thinking about that, and I said, well, but I'm fortunate because all this is artificial intelligence. So I will, I will ask artificial intelligence. I went to the web, and of course, I found on the web someone using deep networks to generate jokes. <laughs> I said, OK, now I know. And, uh, and so this is uh, Janelle Shane, who trained a database. We found a database of 43,000 jokes, uh, fed a neural network with that, and asked the neural network to generate new jokes. 
and she decided to restrict a little bit, first of all, by, by forbidding the use of um, dirty words, let's say, so that you can present it at a conference, and, and restricting to jokes of the type, what do you call a dot, 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 how do you, etc. And, uh, and so here it is. Uh, here is what the, what the, some, some of the ones that were generated by the, by the neural network. Three jokes, quotation mark, many quotation marks. What did the new ant say after a dog? It was a pirate. <laughs> and all the three are like that. They are not even grammatically correct. So they are, in some sense, uh, they are so pathetic that they are hilarious. But uh, the only message I can... Uh, <laughs> the only message I can get from that is that... Um, we still have a long way to go. OK, thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions? Yes. So when you talk about emergent complexity, most people working on um, chaos theory and those sorts of things tend to believe that it's simply a function of the complexity of the network. Um, what do you think is the biggest, and of course it's speculation, but what do you think is the biggest difference between what's going on with our deep networks right now and the brain even of an infant? Um, obviously, if you knew that, you'd make billions, but what do you <laughs> think is probably the biggest difference? Um. I think that in, in some sense what we are seeing, we are seeing these, these smart machines dedicated at, uh, at a single task. Uh, so I think there are two differences. One, one is the fact that uh, in the brain, and I, I was discussing uh, the attitude of a baby playing and so on, the brain is used with many, for many different activities and they are all connected. That is, you will have the reward of the, of the game, of, of the play, of the, of the joy and so on. And all these are emotions which interact and which feed back the brain. And this is totally absent. This is one thing. In terms of more uh, internal representation, the thing that we, that we really don't understand is, uh, what is uh, how the information is really processed in, inside these layers. I mean, how it, how it is that uh, th this notion of emergence that I was, uh, that I was showing before, it's really at its infancy. I mean, people are, are analyzing, technically they call it the, the cross entropy, that is the joint information between an input and a layer and things like that. But we are extremely far for, for, from understanding all these things. So I think there is an enormous amount of work to, to, to do on that. And even on a simpler thing, which is understanding why the networks are able to learn, how is it even possible that you can teach that the network from a database of 100,000 images is able to fix one million parameters. It should be what we call in science overfitting. You have too many parameters. So if it is overfitting, it means that it should be just memorizing the data and not be able to generalize. Yet it generalizes. We are just, and in, in fact in this workshop uh, taking place here, we have the interactions of the physicists together with the computer scientists working in machine learning trying to understand these aspects. Since we have seen so many examples of how the physical systems struggle to outperform biological systems, how close do you think we are to starting to use actual biological systems to perform some of the tasks that are being failed with the physical computerized systems. What, what do you have in Such as the human brain and some elements of the brain in the early studies on various neurological connections and what they are able to perceive and then how they can exponentially increase the data that they can process using some of that to perform some of what we're not able to do with the physical systems. It is true that the, that the, the I mean, that, that is one of the very fascinating aspect of what is taking place at this moment. That is, um, we have the revival of this, of this neural network. This neural network, it is 
really a new paradigm. I, I was trying to explain why. It is because in a standard computer, you have processors. If you destroy one, then the, pro the computer does not work, and so on and so forth. In a neural network, it's much more distributed. And it's like that in our brain also. In our brain, you, you have the destruction of a few neurons. Actually, it happens to us, to each of us every day. The brain still works. A bit less efficiently when you age, but still it works. And so um, this is really this, this idea that you have another way of processing information and of uh, intelligence which was not there, which is not there in the standard computer. And so this comeback of the this comeback of the neural network is something which is really interesting from this point of view. It goes back to how is it that we that we can use architecture based on these artificial neurons that is very simple units that that receive some information, process it just by a weighted sum and sends it. How is it that we can use that to do sophisticated tasks? Now, the fact that the, the first big successes are on vision and language, they are not maybe not totally by case. Even if I, I, I was careful to demonstrate to you that we are very far from having machines that are able to outperform our brains on all these tasks, but still, um, still we have mimicked a little bit the architecture of the brain. We have looked at the V1, we have looked at the neurons and so on. We have designed some new machines based on that. And these new machines, guess what? The first task at which they are smart is vision and language. This is not by case. Um, here, question here. Um, so last year, Google came up with one other program to add to the list of things that you showed, AlphaFold, to solve protein folding. And uh, okay, they outperformed uh, many of the uh, con other conventional researchers or, on, and their techniques for you know, determining protein folding uh, uh, structures given an amino acid uh, sequence. So going back to your question on uh, the Newton's law example, the, as you said, the, the deep neural network doesn't necessarily provide you a generative model of what's happening. But is there a way for a physicist to look at the results of the, I mean, you, as you said, you know everything about the network. Is there a way to build Newton's laws without knowing it by just looking at the results of the network? <laughs> well, this, first of all, it, it was a thought experiment, so I don't have it. I don't have the network that does it, so I cannot look at it. But it's, it's interesting. That is, you, you can try to use these networks, train it, and once they are well-trained, see how they behave. For instance, a colleague that I met uh, last week in, uh, in San Diego is trying to, tr to train a network in, uh, on the problem of quantum mechanics. That is, having a, a potential, one-dimensional potential, and trying to get the density, electronic density in this potential, okay? without teaching the quantum mechanics. Will the computer come up with the idea of a phase and of a modulus of the wave function and so on? Probably not. Apparently, at the moment, it does not. But this is something that, that, that is interesting in itself. That is, maybe, maybe in the end, these machines, they will also show us other ways of reasoning about pieces of science that we know. Let me come back to, the, to, the, to what you said about, uh, about protein folding. I mean, protein folding, in some sense, we know what it is about. We know the rules of the game. I mean, it's, uh, it's basically electrostatics, and uh, so uh, we have to find an, a nice conformation. We know the energy function and so on. So having the help of a computer to do that, it's, there is nothing, nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think it's just uh, we have been helped by computers in order to do a lot of science. I mean, in the last few decades, it has been a major tool. And in this case, I think it would be an addition to something, uh, a tool that, is, that has to be used. And actually, I am one of the persons who is using these networks as, as, a, as a device, as a tool to, to help to do things. So there is nothing, nothing wrong with that, it's, except that it will not come up at the moment. At least it's not able to, to help you to, to build another theory. I mean, if there would be a kind of effective theory of protein folding that, uh, that would uh, be a shortcut in some sense that would, instead of telling you, here is the list of amino acid, here is the electrostatic potential, and so on. But no, I have a more global view, and I can tell you, just like you read a book, I read the sequence, 
And I tell you, well, this will fold in a half helix. That would be much nicer. Maybe one day the, the neural networks will help to do that. This is a low level question. We have both excitatory and inhib inhibitory neurons. I don't see inhibitory yes, yes. in here. Or is it represented by negative numbers? Or Yes, absolutely, negative weight. Okay. I didn't mention that. I, I just said, said at one point, the neuron receives the signals. Some of the signals, it may be that when there is a, a, a signal coming from another neuron, it depletes the activity of the neuron. That would be a negative weight. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's present here. With uh, self-driving vehicles, uh, obviously uh, there are, are many things that have to be in the programming. You know, the vehicle code, recognizing objects, some kind of a, a navigation system so the vehicle would recognize one-way streets and that sort of thing. My question is whether or not all that computing power is actually on the vehicle or does it take more computing power so that it has to be in touch with the Internet at all times in order to obtain that uh, ability? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on the technology of, the, of self-driving cars, but I think that I don't think there is a problem in having all this computing power on board. That's, that's, not, a, that's not an issue, but I think... Uh, the issue is much more fundamental in some sense. A, a concept that you used early in your lecture was, that was the term, was the concept category, categorization. Um, and it's pretty clear that people would be able to categorize cats and dogs. But when one thinks about, say, the word terrorist, or in history, I'm a historian, revolution, those terms mean very different things over a period of time. And you emphasize the, the really fundamental problem of, of, of putting all the data together and the, the human, the scale of the human task of, it, of doing that. But how, does, how can computers help to retrieve, say, historical knowledge if the categories that we use are contemporary categories which don't really capture the contextual nature of events in the past? And my question is, how can deep networks, uh, can they create categories? Does their sheer failure, uh, to, to, when they make big mistakes, does that suggest that maybe something new is emerging such that the human perceptor, the human mind, with its superior understanding, can say this is, this is something new under the sun. You know, this is a shift. This is a new phenomenon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the question. Uh, first of all, the first part of what you said, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful example of the limitation of the present neural network. That is, they are totally unable to put the, the question or the, or, the, or the computation that they do in a context. And uh, neither in a historical context or, or in a context of other events, other in pieces of information. So in this sense, that's what I, I, was, I was stressing all the time. They are just, you know, focused on a very dedicated task. And maybe, and I'm sure that some of our agencies uh, everywhere are trying to identify terrorists on the basis of this and that. But they will use the present day definition of someone who says this is what looks like a terrorist, let's say, and absolutely unable to put it in perspective and to see the evolution in time. Now, about what you said about categories, um, there is one aspect that I did not discuss. I, I discussed, the, let's say, the mainstream of the, of the current research. One other aspect which is uh, probably more interesting for the future is, is what is called unsupervised learning which is to have a neural network which will be able to learn without having the supervisor, without having someone who says, oh, look, this is a cat, look, this is a dog. And, and how it can do that? It can do that by analyzing and trying to, to decide in a database, well, this looks like this, doing some categories, and maybe at some point saying, oh, no, but this category, I think I'd rather split it. I'd better split it into two subcategories, things like that. And that is certainly... Uh, something that has been tried, that is, that is um, there is a lot of work going on that. But, uh, and uh, I think if one wants to go towards something which will be a little bit more intelligence, that's, that's the way to go. My major concern would be about 
emotions and morals. How can we get a computer to have that? That's what makes us human. Well, we are very, very, very far from that. <laughs> Fortunately. What did you say? Fortunately, in my opinion. I would not be very happy to have a computer that shares this emotion. But, uh, but nevertheless, you see, for instance, uh, it's interesting in terms of human behavior that uh, uh, there are examples of people being developing some kind of relation with, with a robot. And, and some kind of, uh, even if the robot has no emotion itself, the robot has no emotion itself. But people can, ha can develop a, a relationship. I, I heard this story of a, a soldier who, is, uh, who, who was uh, using a robot, uh, trained to have a robot that goes in the, how do you call it, uh, minefields? The minefields, yeah. OK? And the robot is there and will put away the mines and uh, deactivate it and so on. And once one of these guys, he, he had its robots, and, and the robots did a wrong move and was hurt by a mine. And, uh, and the soldier went on the minefield to, to get back he, the robot because he was attached to this robot that was his robot. So there was a kind of, uh, I mean, every day's relationship with the robot, even if the robot has absolutely no emotion. No. It's a one way.